Hello. Can people hear me? Um, you can hear me, Raymond. Okay, so we are just admitting people into the room. Um, can I request everyone just put your mics on mute and um, uh, keep your videos off for those who struggle with bandwidth. I will. I will be. Uh, starting in a few seconds. While we are waiting for those who are coming in, I will uh, start us off. It's 11 o'clock. Welcome everybody to the uh, Kenred uh, Living History series with uh, uh, Professor Raymond Sutner as our visiting uh, professor and elder who is um, carrying this series with us and uh, hosted in partnership with ourselves in the Department of History and Political Studies at Nelson Mandela University. If you were here last time, you will recall that uh, the uh, platform is uh, created as part of, um, can I just request for people to mute their microphones uh, just so that we don't hear what's going on in, your, in the background in your home. You'll remember that we began this series as a way of fostering intergenerational conversation as a critical part of uh, knowledge making uh, and uh, community archiving and memory making in Africa, and that we seek to position <laughs> conversation with elders as a critical form of African pedagogy. So we believe that uh, at, at Nelson Mandela that education, especially in the humanities, happens not only in what we put in front of students that comes from books, but we talk to living books, such as Professor Raymond Sutner. Uh, so welcome and uh, welcome also to our, um, welcome to our guests and uh, our respondent, uh, Pedro Mzileni, who is a lecturer uh, in sociology at the Mandela University and a very well-known commentator uh, as well on Power FM and many other media. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, the series has five lectures in, in uh, we have, we've planned five lectures for this series. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one we started off with was focusing on Nelson Mandela's masculinities. And that was quite a provocative and tricky uh, a topic to tackle where we demystified Mandela as a saint or as a hero and really uh, viewed him through his humanness. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on the question of Africanization and emancipatory uh, knowledge within South Africa in the context of debates around decolonization. So with that, uh, thank you, Prof. Satna. Um, if you want his uh, uh, biography, of course, you can get that from ourselves or you can get it anywhere really online because we are talking here to a veteran of the anti-apartheid struggle and a well-known professor. Uh, welcome today, Raymond. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, today's um, presentation is much more um, theoretical than last week's. And consequently, I looked at it again and reworked it a bit because I thought it wasn't really suitable for presentation in the way the written version that I gave you. Uh, next week, I, the next, not next week, the next, the third one will return to human qualities again when I deal with Lutuli, who is personally someone who I believe is very, very neglected and very important for us to interrogate. Today I'm speaking on a topic 
that is very uh, controversial. Africanization scares the wits out of many people. And on the other hand, it is regarded, it is revered by many others. Now, I'm not uh, taking any of those positions. What I am doing in today's conversation is arguing that both colonialism and apartheid were not simply modes of oppression, they were also knowledge projects. They said who, 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 who belongs where, what rights people have, what qualities they have. Uh, and both colonialism and apartheid displaced or repackaged local ideas, local understandings, customs and cultures, and treated these local knowledges as worthless or in an essentialist way, that is having static, timeless meanings that are often hierarchical and also patriarchal. The national liberation movements launched counter-political and military movements against colonialism and apartheid, but also, I will argue, alternative ways of understanding, alternative knowledge projects or ways of understanding. The national liberation movement, movements in uh, contrast tend to depict itself, in the case of the ANC particularly, as the repository of the nation. One finds slogans reflecting this unity throughout the continent. Uh, CPP of Ghana is the people. Uh, Kanu is the mother, is your mother and your father. ANC is the nation. Uh, this article sees Africanization in a way, in the way that I'm going to present it as a central element in the recovery of freedom, provided it is understood as in continual dialogue between local knowledges and a range of other explanatory tools or ways of understanding. I do not believe that the answer to oppression is to simply uh, turn to indigeneity and retrieve it in an unproblematized way. Now, all of this means that we need to have a particular understanding of concepts. Concepts are ways or words that are meant to signify meanings. And my argument is no concept must be treated as static. Every concept is a contested word. Uh, there's a famous article on essentially contested concepts where about six are named. My, my belief is that every con concept, man, woman, boy, girl, house, all of these things are contested in their meanings. And the paper argues that the National Liberation Project while it responded to the divisive aspect of colonialism, has thus far failed to provide an adequate alternative to Western or Northern paradigmatic hegemony. This has negative consequences for explaining and understanding South African society and doctrines like gender relations and feminism in particular. The Western lens or the Northern lens is inapplicable in many respects for explaining social re relations in South Africa. And we haven't done enough in South Africa to unpack the weaknesses of these paradigms. They have a sort of indirect rule in universities where the default position tends to be to defer to Northern paradigmatic ways of understanding. Now, how did the colonial apartheid knowledge project operate? On the one hand, it was a denial of the oneness of black and white, of colonized and colonized, 
Uh, and on the other hand, it was a denial of the oneness of black people in general and of African people in particular. The assertion under colonialism and apartheid of African plurality was not a mark of respect, but a mechanism for division. The identities attributed to different African people tended to be static and rigid, and they generally lowered the status of African women below that of pre-colonial societies. There are disturbing signs that this uh, lowering of the status of women is continuing under the versions of customary law that are being applied in South Africa today with the ele elevation of the status of what are called traditional leaders, some of whom are uh, not really accepted by the communities and are not even uh, in terms of the lineage uh, supposed to be where they are. Now, the national liberation movement's response to colonial divisiveness and colonial domination was in the formation of the ANC in the words of Pixley Ka Iksaka Seme to declare that we are one. It was an appropriate response to the apartheid knowledge project, but the notion of oneness is not unlimited in scope and time. Oneness is a simple but nevertheless problematic concept and it has to be examined when we advance the notion of unity of the people, it must be examined in relation to difference and also other identities. It is for important that when we advance Africanization or we advance unity of any type, we do not do so at the, uh, the expense of diversity, different identities conceived not as static qualities, um, and that the advancement of Africanization is not at the expense of others who live in South Africa. All colonial projects and the apartheid project have been projects of domination over a range of aspects of the lives of people. At the level of knowledge, they have determined who is what and who belongs with whom. And that is simultaneously an identity question and a knowledge question. And the earliest anthropologists were very involved in this process of determining who is who belongs to whom. And the founding fathers of anthropology, like um, Radcliffe Brown, he was the first chair of anthropology at the University of Cape Town, but anthropology was conceived as directly connected to native administration. Um, the denial of the oneness of the African people corresponded to reality in certain respects in the sense that the subdivision, there were, there's no such thing as one African people in the sense that there were subdivisions of the African people and within communities, there have always been variations, even within a people, within particular villages, there have been diverse customary regimes. Uh, the notion of custom and culture and their legacies are therefore not beyond debate. Even if they are recognized as being valid, they are often contested within communities and have always been and cannot simply be resolved by supposed custodians of traditional beliefs. The more conservative claim of uniform observa observance of a particular custom or culture is without basis. It is something which may be true of a particular cluster of people, but there has always been contestation. Uh, uh, Professor Huntonji from Benin, who I quote later, uh, questions the notion of a supposed imaginary consensus 
amongst African people before colonialism. He says if this were the case, there would not have been wars at all because they were all supposedly thinking the same. But all of this is important in understanding apartheid insofar as we tend to emphasize coercion, but apartheid and colonialism did not rely on coercion alone. They also deployed ideology. Ideology did not usually work so well so that there was a predominance of coercion, but there was not, never an absence of ideology. The law and the state were very important in the construction of people in a particular way. The word, uh, the, under the law of the country, people were interpolated, constituted in a number of different ways as South Africans for certain purposes, uh, and that was primarily for whites, but in the case of the criminal law, uh, Africans and other black people would also be subjected to criminal prosecution. So in that sense, they did have um, a sense of a common identity with whites. But in South Africa, black people in general had were constructed grades of uh, inferiority with Africans in particular, not only constructed in a way that gave them uh, lower status, but they were constructed as tribal subjects. They were constructed as Bantu or natives, but also as uh, people of a particular ethnic origin whose political identity was tied to a supposed uh, ethnic identity, which um, erased all other aspects of the being from the point of view of the Bantustan project. Um, the, the apartheid regime and colonialism drew partly on identities that were already in place and corresponded to practices and self-conceptions. They didn't operate on a blank slate there was some validity in the construction of Bantustans for uh, people living in particular areas who did identify in that way. But we must also recognize that um, many people um, conformed to these constructions, many African people conformed to these constructions partly for out of irony, but also partly because you could not enter school or get certain documents unless you said, I'm a Transkayan citizen or I'm a Papuntuswana citizen. Uh, we also have to acknowledge that some of these um, constructions of identities may have been internalized and still be with people in post-apartheid South Africa. There are ways of existence that people followed for a number of decades, which may still be with them. So the apartheid regime and colonialism had a way of operating through ideology that constructed people as inferior subjects, but inferior subjects in the case of Africans who had distinct identities that were part of their political, supposed political evolution. The South African Native National Congress, which became the, the ANC, responded in Seme's words again by referring to the ANC as a native union. In a sense, what he was doing is saying that you have a union of South Africa, we have a native union. They constructed a direct alternative which had potential radical consequences for the future. We are one, they said, but we must recognize that in the ANC constitution, initially it was not open to African women and to other peoples. However, de facto, uh, historians have shown that women were very often uh, de facto members of the ANC in various places and in some cases, uh, non-Africans, especially colors in the Western Cape, 
were often members of the ANC. Also, we need to remember, I'm referring to the ANC, 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 but the ANC was not the primary African nationalist movement initially. It was overshadowed by the, by the Garveyite movement initiated by a uh, West Indian, Marcus Gar Garvey, and transmitted, I think, through sailors coming to South Africa, and also the ICU, Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, was as much a nationalist movement as a union movement, and it was more radical and more Africanist than the ANC. Um, ANC was not, not the primary nationalist movement or political opposition to uh, white domination until the 1950s. And that was the time when, through the defiance campaign, the ANC became a mass movement with 100,000 members. And the Freedom Charter was adopted through a, another mass campaign. But again, that charter itself led to contestation and um, contestation by the PAC walking out contesting the notion that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. Africanism versus multiracialism, although the word non-racialism was coming into usage then to achieve Lutuli particularly. The ANC um, saw itself in the years that followed, it got uh, uh, quite a big setback when it was banned in 1960 after the Sharpeville massacre. And when it went underground, it was not, uh, it took a long time to rebuild. But the ANC built a unity of the oppressed, but with the primary place of the most oppressed people being the African people and the working class as the most exploited. That type of alternative that the ANC represented What's also found again in the UDF, which came into being in the 1980s and had the slogan, apartheid divides, UDF unites, apartheid divides. Now, this unity tends to banish ethnic identities. We've seen it in the um, statements of Semi, which were correct that the African people had been defeated through uh, tribal animosities, divide and rule. Uh, but Michel said, for the nation to rise, the, the tribe must die. Now, that formulation has a problematic element insofar as um, all identifications with the tribe are not necessarily chauvinistic. And there's been a tendency in documents of the ANC and other liberation movements to uh, not recognize that a number of different identities can be inhabited by one person. Uh, that you can be an African, but you can also be proud of your language, your religion, your culture, a number of different things. And I think one of the problems with national liberation movements is these slogans like ANC is the nation or Ghana is CPP is that they tend to expect everyone to be absorbed and all their identities to be absorbed within the identity of the liberation movement as the bearer of future nation. Um, you can see this in the strategy and tactics documents of the ANC, that there's a tendency to equate tribalism with chauvinism. And my argument would be that there has to be a case-by-case -case analysis of the way in which people identify before we can say that. Now, one of the ways that people respond to the, the colonial project is to assert indigeneity the um, legacies that have been more and knowledges that have been marginalized by colonialism and apartheid. 
Now, what is important is that when we retrieve the pre-colonial practices and knowledges of peoples, that we do not do this in with um, reverence for purity. Because as Professor Huntonji argues, uh, there, were never, there was never purity. He doesn't like the word indigenous because he believes that the word indigenous connotes uh, the exotic and that the word indigenous knowledge is used to counterpose to real knowledge. He prefers the word endogenous because he argues that all knowledges have always been in dialogue with others outside of that community. And consequently, what was originally um, pure, um, uh, a product of one society on its own absorbed other uh, influences from other places. Now, what I'm arguing in relation to indigeneity is it's very important that, that people do not slip, slip into the need to uh, assert uh, indigenous or local knowledges un, in an unqualified way because of the way they've been suppressed under apartheid and colonialism. I think it's very important that nothing is beyond debate. If Ubuntu can be used by, by Desmond, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu to be used in one way, but it can be used as Ubuntu armed response or Ubuntu catering services, we can see that every word is up for contestation. So any curriculum development in a liberated and emancipatory South Africa should operate with an assumption of contestation. But it's not only in relation to local knowledges. What are the paradigms that are used for us to understand our own societies? Um, Partha Mukherjee of the, um, from India, an Indian sociologist says, what is Indigenous for the West has become universal for the rest. In other words, the way in which Western feminisms have tended to analyze what is a feminist response is often taken by scholars in South Africa as being appropriate for here. Consequently, when women entered politics as mothers to defend the home, uh, it was treated as a defense of patriarchy, when in fact, that was the front line of defense and was a form of women's empowerment. And we need to be very, very careful in the way in which we take Western uh, paradigms, uh, because even in the West, there is no longer um, Unif there are no longer uniform social relations to which they are applied. There's a lot of heter more heterogeneity and some feminists have argued in Britain and other places that some of the categories that they get in the feminist textbooks are no longer adequately applicable. And the same goes for something like politics where the United States has the most resources and consequently, many scholars from the United States are taken as reference points for understanding South Africa. There was this notion of the dominant party theory, which per, I don't want to go into details here, but it was ill-fitting for South Africa, just as Western paradigms for urban development, for cities, this idea of being a world-class city where you take Paris, London, and New York as uh, the model for developing the South has to be questioned. Within any notion of Africanization, the conception of, con of culture must relate to the previous understanding of South Africa as a European country. 
a European outpost in Africa. Um, where black people were at one point described as Europeans and whites saw themselves not as part of Africa, but Europeans. You can see this when you go and look at the architecture in the, the Durban High Court uh, and you look at the Cal Calcutta, Calcutta High Court, they look almost the same. Uh, Western architecture is applied. At Wits University at one stage, all emails had Latin attached to it, like brown at gaius.wits.xza. Academic parades used to sing Gaudiamus Ius Tour and all sorts of Latin uh, type uh, references. Together, a lot of this has changed since I first wrote this article. Um, now, what I'm arguing in this paper is that we should not be rejecting all that is European, but we need to assert that we are a country, an African country. We need a distinct, um, dynamic African flavor to our cities, our music, our television and other media, uh, as is now happening with uh, Jerusalem, which is now getting out to the whole world. This is not the case in general now where globalization has in fact increased the dominance of homogenizing US culture. It is important that we find a way of inserting African cultural expression as a primary identity within a range of other identities that comprise South Africa that are in a dynamic, uh, inter, uh, constructive inter engagement with one another. All cultures should enjoy equal respect and is out of the creative, non-chauvinistic interrelationship between them that we can build the new South African identities that will bear both distinct African qualities and stand in relation to other cultural formations with their own diversities. And these will include the cultural expressions of, of those who are African in the broadest sense, as many whites uh, uh, claim they are. I'm not de by debating Africanization or being African in isolation, but as part of a process of emancipation. You can't emancipate African people if you only look at the particular, we must work out a relationship between what is particular and what is universal. You cannot elevate the one over the other and erase one or the other. It requires a fresh examination of scholarship in order to surface experiences and voices that have been raised in our society. Nothing is obvious. Everything has to be looked at afresh. Everything has to be contested and argued over. Those of us located in education These are being acted out. Um, and we find a way of ensuring that our educational institutions are places of meaning, not just for those at the top, but those who come with ideas from the bottom up. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Satna. Um, just as I invite uh, Pedro Mzileni to give his response, uh, switch on your video, please, Pedro. I just want to alert you to the 
uh, challenges and comments on the chat section there that we will uh, get into in the in the uh, time for 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 Q and A. So just uh, throw your eye on there as well so that you can address the challenges uh, being uh, put to you there. Um, Pedro Mzileni, uh, the floor is yours. You do have about 10 minutes and I will time you uh, just so that we don't run out of time to converse. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity, Professor Numalangan Kizem. And good morning to the Nelson Mandela University community and those joining us uh, from elsewhere. Uh, firstly, I want to thank, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Center for the Advancement of Mandrashalism and Democracy in, in Mandela University for the invite, a space where I cut my teeth in the academy. And it's a space that continues to be a hub of talent. Uh, of talent elaboration for many of our student activist scholars that we produce in Mandela. I also want to thank the Department of Political Science and History, our reliable partner and neighbor in this exciting project to revitalize the humanities and anchor it in the intellectual traditions of the Eastern Cape and its living memories. So <clears throat> beyond colonialism being a military project, Professor Raymond Sutner invites us here to underscore the intensity of its epistemic project. This begins, he argues, from the apartheid regime's construction of South Africa from a hybrid convergence of violence underpinned in the colonial genre of British modernity. Violence here is used as a paradigm that has successfully categorized almost all our conceptual tools in contemporary social science into two dominant divides of victims and victors, saints and villains, right and wrong, and the recent tune of revolutionaries and sellouts. By extension, this paradigm has also constructed a hierarchization of bodies putting white heterosexual middle class bodies at the pyramid, whilst the black femininity is relegated to the basement. These categorizations were also transplanted to the determination of citizenship in the settler colony, where colonial subjects were juniorized in the crafting of nationhood and statehood into smaller geographic concentrations of linguistic tribes. For instance, we ourselves at Mandela University in, in the Nelson Mandela University community are in close proximity with these questions as the post apartheid state continues to categorize inhabitants of the Eastern Cape as Amaklosa, despite numerous recollections of documented accounts and oral histories maintaining that there is no such a people. Rather, there are a range of Kosa speaking communities, such as Abatembu, Amataleka, Amampondo, amongst others, whom consist of nations. As much as the European empire you will find, the Scottish, the Irish, the Welsh, and the British who consist of different nations, but they all speak English as a language. Satna locates the constitution of the African people to the 1912 convention, which set out to abolish these linguistic tribes for purposes of making the unity of African people a reality. This proved to be a difficult venture, at least for the first three decades, where the African National Congress largely remained an exclusive center for black elite men socialized into British mannerisms of modesty and modernity, which achieved little to turn around the position of subjugation that the African was imprisoned under. It is only in the period of the 1950s where African unity seemed to become a reality. When the colonized began to be concentrated in the urban city for purposes of labor and the residents. The energy of a new generation of young people 
and the bravery of women activists at the time did not only infuse new dynamism into the rhythm of struggle, but it also democratized the membership patterns of the liberation struggle, and it also optimized its intellectual rigor. For instance, the attractiveness of Pan-Africanism and Gavism in the ANC Youth League's program of action adopted in 1949, which later translated into a mass-based project embedded in African working class communities, remains an understudied phenomenon in the making of the mass democratic movement's political and organizational being, as well as the crafting of an African identity broadly. This omission in Satna's paper is a consistent practice that surfaces in the mainstream writings of the left in the Congress movement. The traditional position of ending the chapter on Pan-Africanism on the racial disequilibrium of the Freedom Charter in 1959 and the exclusive privilege, privileging of the Marxist genre in outlining the trajectory of the armed struggle is a practice that is arguably responsible for the problematic male nationalisms that we see in the Congress movement today, including the significant deficits we endure when we begin to look at our history outside the prison of the Communist Party of which Raymond Sardner comes from. To broaden my curiosity around these uh, questions, I am more inclined to see Pokazima Kadla's work on women ex combatants guerrilla girls, combative mothers, and in-betweeners, which shows that the respective categories of guerrilla girls, combative mothers, and in-betweeners consists of women being the driving force of anti-apartheid transnational struggle come war effort. In other words, Magadla shows that the extensive terrain of which guerrilla war took place against the apartheid state was work that was carried out by private individuals and more often than not, black women. Yet, masculine nationalist discourses about the armed struggle present the complex confrontation against apartheid as if it had been exclusively between the state and two non-state liberation forces, which are the MK and APLA. These living memories, in my view, emanating from the knowledge co-creation processes by black women, reminds us that it will be a gross disservice to participation in contemporary South Africa without taking time out to document local histories that emanate from our own households. This kind of work has also been developed from the perspective of analyzing white Africans' households and how the violent heritage of colonization has generated forms of dehumanization in that space, wherein uh, Christopher de Hestazen's work on sitting pretty white Africans, women in post-apartheid South Africa shows that white reproduction was key in these women's access to whiteness as a legitimate form of, <clears throat> that also crafted the post-apartheid identities that we see today in the white community. Um, you said I have 10 minutes, Prof. Let me jump to the post-apartheid period quickly. In your paper, Prof, um, non-racialism features strongly as the vanguard of crafting African identities. And it is masked as though identities, as you say, they travel across time, space, and context. But what I want to pose as the question, which non-racialism are you speaking about? Because from where I'm seated, um, the crafting of non-racialism as the vanguard of African identities is something that uh, Biko as well uh, sort of had a different view. 
If I can go to his work, you uh, know, in, in, in I write what I like. He states that then the basic problem in South Africa has been analyzed by liberal whites as being apartheid. They argue that in order to oppose it, we have to form non-racial groups. Between these two extremes, they claim, lies the land of milk and honey for which we are working, the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis have been mentioned by some great philosophers as the cardinal points around which any social revolution revolves. For the liberals, the thesis is apartheid, the antithesis is non-racialism, but the synthesis is very feebly defined. They want to tell the blacks that they see integration as the ideal solution. Black consciousness defines the situation differently. The thesis is in fact a strong white racism and therefore the antithesis to this must ipso facto be a strong solidarity amongst the blacks on whom this white racism seeks to prey. That, that is the words of uh, Bandu Steve Biko. Uh, in articulating outside uh, the hegemonic vanguard of non-racialism as defined by the Congress Alliance. Now let me switch on as I sort of close off uh, to my third set of questions. The post-apartheid capitalist trajectory is a phenomenon as well that deserves our close attention because the destruction of Southern Africa by the way capital behaved in the continent, it has translated into a concentration of a variety of identities into the major cities of South Africa, right? The major cities of South Africa where South African capital is concentrated, such as Johannesburg, Cape Town, and to a certain degree, Port Elizabeth, where I'm doing my ethnographic study for my doctoral thesis, various kinds of uh, identities from the Southern African region and the rest of the continent are concentrated in these cities. And these identities are coming into a context where the African has been grossly dehumanized. And also in the post-apartheid project, no amount of serious effort has been made to build an economic base for the, col the previously colonized uh, to build their, their wealth from. So there is a fierce scramble, a fierce contestation in the major cities of this country for the limited resources between indigenous South Africans and those who are coming from the rest of the continent in search for opportunities that an open economy rightfully grants them to do so. So in such a context, how then do you craft what is known as an African identity with those complexities in place and how then do you fit the project of non-racialism as a vanguard within a context where the white subject still remains in question about the responsibilities it has failed to do in the anti-racism work in the past 26 years? So those are some of the thoughts that uh, I am grappling with as I try to make sense of what uh, you call Africanization, African identities, and the emancipation in contemporary South Africa. So the, the breakdown of the existing paradigm as I close off a uh, question is, um, we are yet to build an, an intergenerational science of political studies that critically historicizes these questions and that critically engages with contemporary complexities that make this social organ called South Africa. 
we need to do the hard work of theorizing differently and construct alternative paradigms that will generate and converge an ecosystem of grassroots pan-African social solidarities, anti-apartheid and anti-colonial networks of ethical scholarship rooted in rigorous ethnographies and archival labor. For grounding community institutions for local power and using the public mandate to roll out distinct economic pathways to prosperity for every African. Such models, in my view, can take us to a promising path to attain Africanization. With those few words, I thank each one of you for taking time out to listen to me. Thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate it. And goes. Thank you, Pedro, for that uh, uh, rigorous response. And um, just quickly, can I just ask colleagues, can you note your comments on the chat so that I can call on you to make them uh, so that they, I don't miss hands and the rest of it? I think, Pedro, you've brought the issues right to the present here by actually asking us the question, what is the making of Africanization and African identity as we watch for, as we watch the kind of um, kind of a, a conflict over space and resources in places like Johannesburg, where the poor of Sadiq uh, and the poor of Africa come to seek opportunity after apartheid in a country in which whiteness and the dominance of the white economy still remains part of our political economy and architecture. And then one of the problems we faced in the humanities is that people either seek a reactionary response that can be xenophobic, or they seek a politically correct response, which refuses to understand that the terrain for Pan-Africanism is different right now. And so the work that we need to be doing is to actually grapple with those questions, as you rightly say, Pedro, so we can actually talk about a meaningful Africanization under these conditions, but also given the intergenerational uh, lineages that we, are, that we know we are coming from. So uh, thank you for that. Um, and now I'm going to, to um, go to the chat question there. Uh, 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 Elder Basil Brown there saying, this paper is an example of how certain academics in SA tend to falsify our history. The contents of this paper is heavily biased and clearly reflects the perspective of the Stalinist SACP of which the author was uh, or is a leading member. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, Basil, uh, I'm going to ask you to switch on your microphone if you're still around uh, your video so you can just make your comment and your challenge and put that to Prof Satna. Uh, please put on your, your camera as well. Um, uh, can I just ask that just, uh, just that we keep the, the, the order flowing so that the, uh, the, the virtual way we, we, we interacting doesn't become very uh, sort, of, uh, hap, uh, sort of chaotic. All right, uh, uh, Basil, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, my comment there was, uh, you know, as, as, as I say there, um, the, 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 the way this topic is being presented here is from a certain perspective and uh, that and I have a problem with that because it completely denies or fails to acknowledge the contributions of other uh, views or thoughts with regard to how do we go about resolving the national question. Because essentially that's what, what this is part of in terms of our discussion. Uh, and that's where the problem arises because, uh, and this has been a problem that one has been grappling with or trying to, do, to, to address uh, in, in, in recent years by the way in which academia, academics have in fact almost uh, willfully ignored and underplayed the contributions and the ideas emanating from what are considered to be less relevant entities. And uh, one has to say that against the background of what is actually the situation that confronts us today, where we are in fact uh, confronted by widespread racism and racialism and thinking in those lines. And, and more seriously, I think, is uh, with reference to this quote 
of uh, pixel semi, where the, the, at the outset, uh, the ANC recognized that one of the first challenges that they needed to address was uh, challenging the divisions and breaking down tribalism. And yet we see now, more than 100 years later, the ANC is actually propagating and encouraging tribalism, uh, identity politics, making provision for, uh, in fact, creating the conditions for further division and the uh, and raising the specter of uh, intergroup conflict. And again, here we see Heritage Day tomorrow, and people are already organizing around the base on the basis that they, they need to see their particular uh, uh, creed, creed or uh, 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 group identity being given recognition and asserting their rights in terms of the constitution, which of course has made provision for this. And surely these, and, as, and uh, Neville Alexander, who uh, is, is mentioned in this paper, but sadly, as I almost quoted as, as if the, 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 the author is not familiar with his writings, I would have expected a direct quote from Neville Alexander, who is arguably the most uh, erudite and, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro 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 proponent of, of non-racialism. So, so here's the kinds of problems that one deals with. And, and Neville, in fact, in one of his last uh, contributions, alerted us to the to the dangers of this of the real of, of a rwanda fight taking place here in south africa because of this uh, 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 backsliding if you like to the uh, you know this group identity this uh, identity politics that is now seeming to take to dominate the world so i'll, I'll leave it there and wait for the prof's response yeah um, thank you so much. And um, I just want to uh, note that as well, Pedro, please. Um, there is a comment from Abongile Davani. This is Abongile that serves as a comment and perhaps pose a question. Whiteness that is still present, even in the absence of a white person from language to attitudes as bigger reflections testify. So whose identity are we carrying? Are we developing as blacks or moving away from our identity to embrace whiteness? All right, Abongile, uh, if you want to switch on your camera there, and uh, if you want to further clarify your, your question, I can't really see you, so I need you to switch on your, your camera, unless you don't want to. Um, I noted some people, uh, uh, hi, in Vamutala. I did see Prof. Denise Zinn somewhere. I don't know if she's still in. I noted uh, Andrew Leach. Hi, Prof. Andrew Leach. I noted Professor Salim Badat. Hello, Professor Salim Badat. Um, who else did I see? So we've got quite a, a good, strong presence of, of elders here. Uh, feel, feel free, everyone, to make your contributions. Abongile. Okay, so Abungile is not making his comment or her comment uh, on the... No, Doctor, I'm not really comfortable on video. Okay, Debucho, you want to say something? Can you switch on your microphone as well? And your video, thanks. And then we'll go to the two participants. Video. Hi. Hello. Hi, Thanks. All right. Um, um, thanks. I just wanted to. It's not really a question, but speaking on on Africanism and 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 decolonizing ourselves as as Africans. Um, there is one, two, in fact, but I'd just like to speak about one main topic. Um, it's one of the most useful tools used to colonize, and we still keep shying away from it or, 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 or speaking about it to, to still decolonize ourselves. That's religion in particular. Um, for example, I would just like to, 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 to clarify this. Given, given, given Africa, just as Africa as a whole, I would say 
majority, besides atheists and agnostic, and agnostic people, be, um, majority of the whole southern African part, it's precisely Christian. When you move up to West and East Africa, you start, the, 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 the popularity in the space starts sharing um, Muslim and, and, and Christianity in it. And, and, and just that brings about a different me me mentality in, in the same vicinity. That should explain why we have pastors from West Africa coming to pray for people in Southern Africa, coming to pray for, pe for dead people in Southern Africa to, 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 to wake up, like to, to wake up from the dead. It says something about our naivety too. Like besides speaking um, um, decolonization and what it's, it's like Pedro said, it's a, it's a, it's a military process. It's a colonial process which uses so much intellect. It uses so much intelligence, and it, 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 it it's actually more, more powerful in our heads. So till we can ourselves under, understand in our families, in our spaces, um, I would hate to say this, but more often than not, it will be more, 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 it will yield more results in younger generations than in our older generations for, for a better Africa tomorrow. To really not shy away from, from, from intellectual facts that first got colonizers to Africa in the first place. We need to know what that is. If you do not understand why they left their home to get here in the first place, then you don't understand precisely what we are intellectually intending to free ourselves from. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, Tabuko. That, that I'm going to, yeah, thanks. I'm going to take it back to the two uh, 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 discussions there. Listen, there's a very important question here. Well, there's two. One is uh, how, how do we we need to tap into some of the historiographies and some of the writings and some of the debates of uh, movements such as the uh, the unity movement to find the, the 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 guiding lights. How do we proclaim our Africanness without succumbing to what uh, Basil is warning about and that it continues to be a warning, um, like a warning signal that there's a way of 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 being African that still holds to non-racialism, but there's also a way of succumbing to the very enticements of that. Um, so I think Pedro and, and, and Raymond, there's a way, there's something that we need to do to, to go into there. And again, Gabuho is again raising the, the issues around in the popular realm, especially Pan-Africanism in the context where we ourselves have taken on, we are modern people. We are our own modern people. We have all these variants within us. Um, but it also in our urban context where this, these ideas of being African play out <laughs> quite differently than, than, than what an academic or in these uh, university debates that are being had. And I think it's going to be very important for any university to be able to get out of itself and deal with what's happening in the popular and in the outside of the universities, basically. But I think what happens in universities is because we are behind the screen, and I understand there's a need for that, is that you're then out of touch with and out of sync and out of step with the popular sentiment, which in a way delegitimizes what the academic world is doing and leads to a greater credibility for reactionary forces in society. Um, so I will invite Raymond to, to respond and then uh, Pedro. Uh, I assume that I should not be talking longer than about five minutes. Consequently, okay. the, I, I don't know if that's correct. Uh, no, that's fine. Go, go ahead. Five minutes is just about mm, right, yeah. What I feel in that light is it's hard for me to do justice to Pedro particularly, who raised a lot of issues, who uh, did not come in on a single issue, came on in on a number of different issues. And I'm very impressed very appreciative of the trouble that he took. And I take his points about the sidelining of uh, women's contribution and particularly unknown, relatively unknown people through the valorization of armed struggle, whether of MK or of Appler. I also believe uh, his notion of the hierarchy of bodies is very, very important. And insofar as I have not 
paid adequate attention to it, I uh, will in future look at that in order to ensure that I have not uh, fallen into that trap. Um, I also want to say that um, I didn't uh, uh, I didn't see my paper as being an advancement of non-racialism, uh, which Pedro and others critique. I, I've done that in another paper, and in that paper, I didn't actually have a clear idea or a final position on what non-racialism means. I believe that non-racialism itself, the relationship between different peoples, is something that um, we need to argue a lot more about. It's not a given. And I don't have a problem. I don't see the notion that I have of non-racialism, which I don't, I'm not clear myself on how, uh, what it will mean to have a non-racial society. I don't have any problem with, a no, with it coexisting, whatever that non-racialism will be, with black solidarity. I was not intending, if it did come across, that I was um, rejecting that. I definitely do not. In fact, I see black solidarity, African solidarity, solidarity of the oppressed as being an integral component of the South Africa we still have to build, which maybe the term non-racialism is not necessarily the most appropriate term. I'm open to that. Um, I don't agree with thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It's sort of, it means we tend to box things in. What I do agree with is Pedro's um, idea that maybe I did not give enough attention to a number of different forces and the weight that they should have in the unfolding of a future South Africa, uh, whether it's at the level of the capitalist mode of production with the level of population groups. Um, so I take those points, but I'd like to see, uh, if it has a written version, I'd like to see it and give um, uh, adequate attention to it. I certainly was not advancing then, not racialism as the vanguard of a new South Africa, because I think it's very contested. To um, with regard to Basil Brown, I just want to make it very clear. I have not been in the ANC or the SACB since the Zuma rape trial of 2006. So I'm not speaking as um, a representative of either of those organizations, but obviously my background influences a lot of the way I still see things today. However, I want to make it very clear that I have a lot of respect for the contribution of historiography of the unity movement, uh, people under, writing under nom de plumes like Nguni, Macheke, uh, 300 years, uh, role of the missionaries in conquest, uh, Van Skoor, Dora Taylor, many, many others. Uh, and I believe that not enough credit has been done uh, long before the so-called revisionist historians of the 1970s were looking at history from below, uh, people from the unity movement were doing that. My paper, I don't see as adequately addressing the national questions. I wasn't really trying to, I wasn't aiming to advance one conception. I was actually trying to open up, insofar as I didn't succeed in opening up, I'm willing to look at it again um, and find ways of um, uh, doing justice to other ways of seeing. With regard to Neville Alexander, as it happens, he and I used to get on very well, uh, but that particular quotation of his is one that I see as a form of race denialism. When I submitted an article published in Theoria, on non-racialism, they said it's not representative of Neville's writings. I found a number of other quotations that were very similar to that. And I think some of them may be in that article. 
Um, on, yeah, so I agree we mustn't elevate identity politics above everything else. Uh, I'm not arguing for that. All I'm saying is identities must not be erased in the context of unities, but the way we conceive identities must be as dynamic uh, as human beings are. On to Borjo's points, um, I think we must be very careful that we don't tar all religions with the same brush. Religions have sometimes been, in South African history, very important progressive uh, parts of the building of resistance and conceiving of the future. And I will be dealing with Lutuli in the next input. I believe that Lutuli was a liberation theologist before liberation theology was known, uh, widely known in South Africa. So I, I would disagree with that. Um, yeah, I think those are all the points I want to say. Let me say uh, in conclusion, I didn't present this paper as the final word. Uh, it is a contribution, which I hope will open up discussion. I don't see myself as an infallible thinker who's got all the answers. Uh, so I hope that clarifies. Thanks. Uh, we won't forget that last week you walked back some of your Mandela uh, debates with Zong Kem Simang. So it's good to be able to walk things back as new evidence comes to light. You can check that out on YouTube if you want to see what it was Raymond was walking back on Mandela. Uh, I think Ken Red needs to somehow share that link. It's a very interesting uh, discussion that um, Pedro, please. And then what we're going to do, let me just lay out what's going to happen as we reach to the close. Pedro will speak. I'll open up for briefly one, one very short round of questions. Then I will ask them to sum up completely. Please don't forget that today the Center for Women and Gender Studies is hosting Celeste Ntuli at 1 p.m. So if, if you don't know who Celeste Ntuli is, you, you don't know what African uh, robust feminism is. So uh, she's brilliant, brilliant actress and, and comedian. Pedro, your responses, and then we, we start wrapping up. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Prof. Uh, because of time is indicated, I'm just going to respond to three. Firstly, uh, from Prof. Raymond Sutton's uh, response, um, I, I, I acknowledge it. It now makes things uh, more more clear, and uh, I, I I do agree with uh, with some of the submissions that he has made uh, in 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 return, and definitely um, further engagements with uh, with him from my side about uh, the, the the paper will definitely continue beyond uh, this conversation because the questions that you raise in there are ones that I am scholarly interested in at, at the moment. And then secondly, um, Debocho's submission around um, Christianity in Southern Africa, uh, where he looks at, uh, where he submits that uh, there are pastors in urban South Africa who pray for people to wake up from the dead. Um, the, the, the question around uh, religion uh, itself and what it has become uh, in the current uh, context of capitalist modernity in South Africa, um, it's, it, it's something that should be interrogated in terms of... Hey! So the prophet got disturbed. Go ahead. That's just uh, Ms. Mugwena's baby, don't worry. <laughs> okay. So the, the 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 trajectory of Christianity, right, in the in the in the in the current capitalist modernity in post-apartheid South Africa is something that that needs to be interrogated more critically, uh, in terms of asking ourselves as to what happened exactly to the religion of Christianity itself uh, during this uh, during these times. Um, and, and, and the influences of the material conditions of Southern Africa that they had uh, 
uh, around uh, for me that's where I am I, I am more inclined uh, towards otherwise Christianity uh, as, a, as, a, as a concept right it, it, it has taken many forms in the past 200 years right and if you read um, for an example the recent uh, work uh, published by uh, on mothers of the nation looking at Manyano women in South Africa uh, she, she makes it clear that how uh, Christianity uh, consisted of uh, you know a variety of meanings for black women and how they utilized it in their own context for uh, their own emancipation, both in private and also in public spaces where they find themselves as a, as a, as a community. So there are many ways that the, the religion has been utilized usefully, uh, and it entailed a, a strong African meaning rooted in the traditions of our communities and our, household, and our households as, 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 as indigenous South Africans. So, her book, I would strongly recommend the book that you, you, you look into it. Uh, it. It offers some groundbreaking um, possibilities on how we look at uh, Christianity in the context of how black women have utilized it in the past uh, few years. <clears throat> and then um, lastly on, there was a question that came through from Abongile Tavani who asked about what then is the identity that we are embracing now that uh, this, the, the, the systems of, of class continue to be in place and uh, the, the, the dominant body around them remains uh, our, our, our white colleagues, especially in the center of the, of the suburb. Uh, look, the way capital has moved as well uh, in the, in the in the, in the city centers of our country. Um, it has moved from the traditional central business district that we used to know, the CBD, and it has shifted to the new suburbs now that have been formed. And those are the new enclaves now uh, where you know, forms of wealth, racism, and so on are concentrated, right? And, and, and critical, uh, critical studies of, of, of whiteness, I think that project was still being um, established uh, by the Chair for Critical Studies of Education Transformation last year or two years ago, uh, looks at these questions. And what is it exactly that can be done to deeply interrogate the center, the center of the city where wealth remains concentrated and therefore the aspirations it generates for the precarious middle class of South Africa that consists mo mostly of uh, black young people, right? So how do you negotiate the two, right? You come from uh, a, a household, right? That has been dehumanized for so, for so long and you find yourself in this post-apartheid context that made so many promises to about the transition as a, as, a, as a black young person. But because the structures of the economy, in, in other words, we live in, in, a, in, in, in a context that consistently doesn't have uh, the jobs and the opportunities that were promised in the 1990s, they no longer exist in the current moment. Now, when you find yourself in that context as a, as a black young person who just left university with so many aspirations, uh, how then do you negotiate these uh, complexities that you find yourself in? How do you negotiate your identity versus your, your aspirations in such a post-apartheid economy that is uh, structured in, in those racialized architectures? So those are some of the questions that are very difficult to uh, engage uh, adequately on a, on, on a platform like this one. They would need a separate uh, engagement altogether. Thanks, Prof. Okay, so I'm going to be very unfair. I don't want us to creep up on the gender center seminar that is about to begin at one o'clock. I want to give you time to go stretch, go fetch the children from school and everything that you need to do, make lunch and so on, so that you can just uh, relax uh, and participate in the gender center. 
Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, kind of bring us to a close with some questions rather than some answers. I'm just going to give Raymond the opportunity to just briefly, uh, you know, sort of prompt us for the next uh, uh, discussion on Lutuli and his importance. You know, there's a huge hero worship of Biko uh, amongst young people right now and no wish to engage with those who came before Biko that made Biko. And quite frankly, anyone who, who knows me knows that I, I can't handle that. That's not black intellectualism. Black intellectualism handles all our lineages of intellectual uh, culture. So we're going to be going into Lutuli um, and the Rhodes, former Rhodes SRC president, Usam Gelem Gadi, is um, going to be the uh, discussant with U U U Prof Sadna. Um, so um, effectively, the questions here are really now coming to the front, which is what is this Africanization under our current context? And I would challenge you, Pedro, the, the new black middle classes um, and say that Nile Ziman guys, stop asking what white people are going to do for you or what your aspirations are doing for you. The question is, what is the meaning of Africanization today for going forward for independence um, and self-autonomy uh, for Africans in the coming future? These are the challenges that we're going to face because certainly we know that white capital isn't about to answer that question for you or for us. So it's a constant challenge that we are putting to our students. The question is your creative imagination your militancy um, must be able to, uh, to, to, to formulate an intellectual and uh, scholarly culture that's going to actually resolve these questions as we go forward. So with that, Raymond, can I invite you to prompt us for the next seminar so we can wrap up and, and, and take a break so we can return for the Gender Center. Just unmute. How do I ask you to unmute? Uh, Prof. Raymond, can I ask you to unmute your mic? Music, sorry. Um, yeah, let's go. At the center of everything with Lutuli is his Christianity. And I, as an atheist, have had to engage with his religious beliefs because I believe they are central to the moral integrity and ethical leadership of Lutuli, which is so important for us today. And it's astonishing that this is the 60th anniversary of the uh, Nobel Prize. He got in, he collected in 1961, but it was in 1960, and there's no mention of it at all. Lutuli has been sidelined. And I believe that when we study his life, it also will take up some of the questions of identity that have been raised today. How within one human being, a progressive version of Christianity coexisted with being a, a, a chief, an elected chief, mind you, but he had to interact with a lot of people who are non-believers in Christianity, but believers in their own um, uh, 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 local systems of knowledge and communication uh, with uh, uh, ancestors and other forms of religious belief, but I also deal with, will deal with Lutuli in the context of armed struggle, uh, non-violence, the fetishization of militarism and military heroism in South Africa today. I believe that Lutuli, he did come to accept armed struggle, but he nevertheless believed in the value of peace and non-violence it's something that I will grapple with in the talk, among, as well as this chapter and a few other things that come up with it. So thank you so much, Prof. Sadner. So one of the key themes uh, in the next discussion is this issue of violence and its just use during struggle and, and how we, we, we provide a justification for armed struggles um, or, or violent mm -hmm. confrontations with systems. Thank you, everyone. There's comments there on the side. So Luso Mata is saying, my comment stems from the way Africans see themselves, how we're perceived by others. I think it will take time for Africans to be totally emancipated from our colonizers because we have accepted Western teachings. And as a result, we see them as being superior to African teachings. We need to accept who we are first before embracing foreign concepts. Thank you so much, Dr. Made. I'm going to request uh, that uh, we, we close today 
and I will see you all uh, at one o'clock. Uh, if you don't have the link for the Gender Centers um, seminar, email me, nomalanga.nkize at mandela.ac.za and I'll be able to forward it to you. Um, otherwise, thank you so much and I will, I look forward to engaging uh, next time. Thank you. <laughs>